20th and 21st centuries, organizational leadership has been a keen interest area for research and development because of the clear and measurable impact that leaders have on their organizations. This gives you a sense of the dominant themes and explanations for what makes a good leader that have emerged over time. For example, in the early 20th century, the questions of interest were how leaders were able to control the people who worked for them and how they could centralize power in order to drive the workforce to maximum productivity. That led researchers and practitioners to take a look at those leaders who were more and less effective. And in the 1930s, they began to ask a different set of questions. What kind of traits made someone a good leader? But unlike a couple of weeks ago when we talked about traits, the 1930s researchers viewed them as static, something that we're born with, not necessarily something that we develop. Then over the next couple of decades, researchers started to look at leaders as they were embedded within their groups and organizations to start to look at the interactions between the leaders and the followers. Not surprisingly, that led to a view and exploration of leadership as a set of behaviors. So moving from something being that we're born with to a set of behaviors that we can demonstrate. And in the 1970s, this was put into the context of the organization itself and how the organization behaved internally and externally. But in the 1980s, we took a bit of a step backward to focus on the individual again. But instead of only focusing on the individual and the traits as they did in the 1930s, it was in the context of persuasion, influence, and the factors that led to the transformation in organizations. And that continued as a dominant theme throughout the 80s and the 90s. So now as we're a couple of decades into the 21st century, we tend to focus on developing leaders, acknowledging that there are traits and skills, but believing that these can be developed in different people to different degrees, and that they're all situated into group and organizational dynamics. To borrow from contingency theory, trying to identify which factors enhance different aspects of leadership and what kinds of leaders are needed in different situations. But if we strip it all back and ask the more basic question of what is leadership? At its heart, leadership isn't a person, it's a process, and one where an individual influences a group in order to achieve a common goal. This means leadership isn't about being the boss. It's about influence, engagement, and specific objectives. And as we'll talk about, management and leadership are related, but very different things. But first, let's talk about the differences between leadership and leaders. When we think of leadership, we should think about four qualities of leadership. First, it is a process. Given that we're talking about influencing in order to achieve an objective, there's a start, a middle, and an end at the very least to it. So it's about how those objectives develop. Second, it is an inherently persuasive endeavor. This isn't just about having blanket power to make people do things. Leadership requires buy-in and generally goodwill in order to be successful. Third, it's always in the context of a group or organization. Leadership can't exist without followership. This means that leadership always exists in a social context with all the challenges that come with it. We cannot divorce it from that interaction and that social context. Fourth and finally, leadership focuses on common goals. Those common goals need not be corporate. They can be entertainment, social, political, really anything. But in the group context, there has to be goals. So when we put this as leaders and when we think of individuals within the context of leadership as a concept, it has four implications. First, leaders and followers are all involved together. Because it is always in this group context, we have to understand what it means to follow in order to understand what it means to lead and vice versa. To this point, we've been focusing on what it means to be a good member of an organization, and this is where we shift it to that other perspective. Second, there is mutual dependence between leaders and followers. If we didn't need both, we wouldn't have both. Leadership helps give direction and vision, and then followership is about getting things done. Third, however, within the leader-follower dynamic, it's most typically the leader that's going to set the tone for initiating and maintaining the relationship with followers. 
This certainly carries with it extra interpersonal skill requirements, but that's a critical point to acknowledge. And fourth and finally, leadership is a skill, just like anything else. So one very important thing to note is that leaders are not and cannot behave as if they're better or above their followers. That is especially today the quickest way to lose support. Leaders don't need to have formal positions. That's not what it's about. It's not about an explicit power structure. Across leadership research and practice, there are a few critical themes that emerge. The first of these is the comparison between the trait and the process view of leadership. One of the points that I'm going to emphasize is that leadership is a skill and not a trait. However, in a lot of popular culture and popular ways of thinking, it's thought about as something that people just have or don't. So it's worth taking some time to deconstruct this belief. Let's start with the comparisons between the trait and the process view. Trait leadership suggests that people have special, innate characteristics or quali qualities that differentiate them from non-leaders. So these qualities reside in select people and really that it's something that's an inborn talent. The process view of leadership, though, is that it's a property or a set of properties possessed by differing degrees to different people. So they're observed in leadership behaviors and so they can be learned. So the trait theory of leadership will focus on these elements. Now it's important to note that these are all qualities of good leaders. However, rather than being inborn, these are skills that can and should be developed. So these are what we typically call intangible skills, and they develop with experience, with practice, reflection, and feedback. Now of course, some of these skills will come to, more, to people more easily than others, but all of them can be developed. When we consider the process of leadership, it begins to make sense why different skill sets are so helpful. Good leadership is based on the exchange between the leader, context, followers, and outcomes. It also means that it's a dynamic process that will change with different contextual follower and outcome factors when those are changing. Take, for example, Jacinda Ardern, the Prime Minister of New Zealand throughout the COVID crisis. She took a hard line with lockdown, basically locking everyone down in New Zealand quickly and restricting travel into and out of the country. Actions that outside the context of the pandemic would be unacceptable in a modern democracy. However, those actions also required the people of New Zealand to comply, including support from citizens, businesses and government. And in that context, her leadership and her ability to persuade people that the actions were right and necessary has increased her mandate because they were successful. New Zealand came out of lockdown and life is relatively normal, aside from the ongoing travel restrictions. But because the rest of what she has done has been successful, people accept the continued travel restrictions. Now compare that to the US or the UK, where there have been problems with the clarity of leadership, differences in context, outcomes, and absolutely differences in the follower's willingness to comply. This is why the process view is critical. Ardern could have been copied and pasted into the US and UK, but because the dynamics were different, she may not have been as successful or successful at all. Once we consider the trait versus process dynamic, the second key theme in leadership is whether it's assigned versus emergent. And that also makes a big difference in how we see it. Now, I've already talked about the fact that a leader doesn't necessarily have to hold a formal position of power. However, they may. And if they do, that changes the process of leadership in some meaningful ways. When we think about assigned leadership, we're thinking about formal positions that are occupied like team leaders, department heads, and directors. One of the critical sources of an assigned leader's influence is the position itself. Now, leadership is still a process and all the factors that I mentioned still apply, but there is a boost with that formal position. However, leaders can also emerge from within the group. Emergent leaders will carry with them a lot of influence. So these are people who don't necessarily have a formal position, and they're sometimes called opinion leaders.
These are people who are respected and frankly, even the assigned leaders work to make sure that they have the emergent or opinion leaders on their side so that they can be successful. Emergent leaders engage and get feedback and information from different people within the group or organization. So they're often communicating both up and down within the organization. And that brings us to the connection between leadership and power. Power is defined as the capacity or potential to affect beliefs, attitudes, and actions. Not surprisingly, there's a lot of overlap with that definition and leadership being a process where someone is able to influence the group towards a common set of goals. However, there's a difference between the types of power and that has a lot to do with the implications within the organizational setting. For example, according to French and Raven, there are five different bases of social power. Three are associated with the power conferred based on the positions that people occupy, and two are based on the personal or the emergent power that people have. So let's take a look at each of these. We'll begin with the positional power sources. The first of these is legitimate power. French and Raven argue that people like a president, a prime minister, or a monarch have legitimate power as does a CEO, religious minister, or fire chief. When we think of legitimate power, we can think of electoral mandates, social hierarchies, cultural norms, and organizational structure. They all provide the basis for legitimate power. This type of power, however, can be unpredictable and unstable. For example, if someone loses a title or position, their legitimate power can instantly disappear because the people who are influenced by the position rather than the power that the leader themselves had. Also, the scope of the power is limited to situations that others believe the leader has the right to control. For example, if a fire chief tells people to stay away from a burning building, they'll probably listen. But if he or she tries to make two people act more courteously towards one another, they'll likely ignore the instruction. The second type of positional power is reward power. People in power are often able to give out rewards. These can include raises, promotions, desirable assignments, training opportunities, and some simple compliments. These are all examples of rewards controlled by people in power. If others expect that you'll be you'll be able to reward them for doing what you want, there's a high probability that they'll do it. The problem with this power base is that it may not be as strong as it first seems. Supervisors rarely have complete control over salary increases. Managers often can't control promotions by themselves. And even CEOs need permission from their boards of directors for some action. Also, when you use up the rewards or when the rewards don't have a high enough perceived value, the power weakens. The third positional power source is coercive power. This source of power can also be problematic and especially because it can be abused. What's more, it can cause dissatisfaction and resentment among the people that it's applied to. So threats and punishment are examples of common coercive tools. Leaders can use coercive power when they imply or threaten that someone can be fired, demoted, or denied privileges. While the leader's position may allow them to do this, it doesn't really mean that it's a good idea or that there's going to be justification. Sometimes leaders will have to punish people, but that should be viewed as a last resort. If a leader uses their coercive power too much, quite frankly, people will leave. And it's very possible, especially in today's climate, that you're likely to be accused of bullying, which carries with it meaningful consequences. So positional power sources can be unstable for the reasons identified within each of those. So let's take a look on the personal sources of power as the second type of, of the, the basis of social power. Relying on positional forms of power alone can also result in cold technocratic and honestly impoverished styles of leadership. French and Raven argue that to be a true leader, we need to have a more robust source of power than title or the ability to reward or punish or even access to information. So it suggests that there are two personal power sources. First is expert power. This is when a leader has the knowledge and skills that enable them to understand a situation, suggest solutions, 
use solid judgment, and generally outperform others. As a result, people will listen to the leaders, trust them, and respect what they say. So as a subject matter expert, people will, people's ideas, leaders' ideas have value and others will look to them for leadership in that area. Expert power is also valuable because the leader can expand their confidence, decisiveness, and also reputation for effective thinking and action into other subjects and issues. So it's a good way to build and maintain expert power. And this also helps leaders to improve their leadership skills. For example, they can read more about building expert power and use it as a, an effective foundation for leadership. A second type of personal power is referent power. Referent power comes from one person liking and respecting another and identifying with them in some way. So for example, celebrities have referent power, which is why they can influence everything from what people buy to which politician they should elect. In a workplace, a person with referent power often makes people feel good, so they tend to have a lot of influence. But referent power also is a big responsibility because leaders don't necessarily have to do anything to earn it, so it can be abused pretty easily. Someone who is likable but who lacks integrity and honesty can rise to power and can use that power to hurt or alienate people just as well as gain personal advantage. So relying on referent power alone is also not a good strategy for a leader who wants longevity and respect, but when it's combined with expert power, it can help people to be very successful. And of course, when you add in positional power sources, you, you can see that in the mix, having multiple sources of power is actually to a leader's advantage. The final dialectic compares leadership and management. This visual lays out the critical differences between the two and hopefully helps to summarize some of the critical differences in the types of leadership and power that ultimately emerge. When we think of management, we should be thinking of a function that focuses on planning, budgeting, evaluating, and facilitating group goals, whereas leadership is based on relationships and emphasizing selecting, motivating, and coaching talent in order to build trust and move towards common goals and interests. Obviously, a manager can also be a good leader, and a leader doesn't necessarily have to be a manager. So when we think about these differences, when we think about the key themes, it's worth having in mind visions of what you think are good leaders, bad leaders, and also trying to explain why those different people fit into different categories.